Jermaine Pennant, welcome to the show. Cheers, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to kind of dig into the story. Where did it all begin? Where we're from, it was a lot of drugs, a lot of crime, very tough estate. People look in and go, oh my God, that's a dangerous place. But when you're in it and they're your people, you feel safe. Come on, son, we're going to London. We're going to speak to Arsenal. They've I was still a schoolboy. This is what I've been dreaming of. And it just felt like another kick in the teeth. It was like, oh, what have I got to do? I score a hatchet on my debut. And then even that wasn't enough. You see those blue lights flashing behind you, what's going through your head? Oh, yeah. You've you make bad decisions. Not knowing why, I was just thinking that I'm just a nutcase. Prison to thinking that my career's over for then a year later, playing the Champions League final, getting a man of the match. The taxman, he was saying I owed a million or so. I was thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have to go bankrupt. I came from nothing, my family was poor. I was embarrassed of who I was and where I came from. We're all human, just because we get paid a lot doesn't mean that the troubles that the normal people have, we don't have. Guys, Matt Haycock's here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycock Show, where today I've got a world record-breaking footballer at just 15 years of age. He's played for mega clubs like Arsenal and Liverpool. He's also overcome adversity, bouncing back, having been to prison, plus many, many other things to talk about. Jermaine Pennant, welcome to the show. Cheers, thank you for having me. I say welcome to the show, welcome to joining me for my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> if it's going down well. <laughs> Lovely. I just hope I don't choke on any more bre <laughs> any more breadcrumbs. <laughs> so, um, I mean, where did it all begin? We got we got a lot to talk about today. I'm very excited to kind of dig into the story, but let's uh, let's rewind to the beginning and uh, tell me about your childhood. Tell me about you know first kicking a ball and um, and and how it all how it all started. Where did it all begin? Um, I think I was about well, from when I could walk. Really, I was kicking anything that was possible to kick. Um, I would slow football people. Um, apart from people, but anything round, <laughs> put it that way. Anything round, I was I, I was kicking, and rather than playing toys, I was always wanting to play with a football or you know a tennis ball. Even the back in the day, the old Eero washing balls used to put the liquid in and put the ball in. I used to use that as a football around the around the the kitchen, and I was always playing with friends at primary school and whatnot. And then my dad took me away one 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 summer to Bournemouth and. Um, <clears throat> He threw a beach ball at me and I controlled it, kicked it back. And he stood there in a bit of like, where did that come from? So he thought it was just a one-off. So he kept doing it and I kept, you know, volleying it back with, with technique as, as a, a young, talented uh, individual would do. And then he thought, oh, okay. You How old? I was about six. I was, I was, I was six when he, I think he noticed that. Um, and then I just, yeah, my love for the game just blossomed year on and from there. But when you were six and you were doing that, I mean, did you did you know what you were about to do? Was in it, you, you'd been kicking around on your own, just not in front of your dad. It wasn't like just a magic trick where you looked at your feet and thought, "What the fuck's just happened there?" Like, I mean, you you, you knew what. Was yeah, going it was happen. kind of because I obviously I, I I know day to day, and when I'm out with friends and we play football and whatnot, and at school in the play playgrounds, I knew that was I was this was natural. So it's, in my head, it wasn't something that oh. Uh, I mate, I thought, oh, this is I'm just good at this sport. I, this is what I can do, and that's how it kind of went through all my my childhood until you start in your latter years, where you thought, oh right, I can really, I can be like these guys who I watch on videotapes, cassettes, um, and on TV. I can be like these guys now. Um, I have their talent. So how did you go from that kicking the ball on the beach to uh, you know to I guess getting signed at 15? Um, well, it was um, my my friend played for a team called Clifton All Whites in Nottingham. Uh, in Clifton um, Jermaine Genius already played for them but my school friend he played for them and obviously at school in primary school I was one. Of, I was the best the best kid there and he and he thought you know what come to training with us one day they used to train on like on, on a Tuesday night the parents will take him down he said come to come to training so I went uh, I had no like sports kind of equipment I was in trousers I was playing trousers and trainers in a, in a and a t-shirt, I just looked so out of it compared to everyone else. And um, yeah, I was, just, I, I was a big difference. And straight away, they said, oh, would you like to play every Saturday for us? Would you like to sign up? Um, and that, that was when I was about nine. So that was my first ever team when I, when I was nine. And then I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, you had to pay £2.50 for subs. I never. <laughs> they let me off, obviously. My up, um, upbringing was a little bit different and, and, and struggled. So, um, but yeah. So, but when I when I was playing for them, it kind of just you know took off from there. And then it also goes goes into your school as well. Your school 
send out trials and <clears throat> Notts County, Notts Forest would send out trials to all the local schools and players would go there and only a handful would make it. And it was Notts County that at 10 said, yeah, come and sign and play for Junior Magpies, that was called then. And that was from, I think, 10 to probably, well, it's supposed to go 10 to 14. But by 14, I was in the, um, it's called the YTS scheme, which is equivalent to the academy. And you got signed at, was it for Arsenal at 15 for a 2 million signing on fee? Right? Yeah, um, the fee was 2 million pounds at the time. So was it 1999? And forgive my total football naivety, but I, I thought I thought you couldn't earn money as a kid. No, that wouldn't, <clears throat> that wouldn't go to me at all. So who's that? So that's you? from the club to the club. Oh, sorry. So that's just a fee. So that's because you were, you were already signed for not, you were signed was, for not, yeah. not earning any money for them because you're not allowed to earn any money. Yeah. But then but they buy you. The conversation. The you, not pay you any money. <laughs> yeah, because I was on their books and they would say, well, he's a, he's got a talent and he could earn us this. So it's called compensation. When you're not actually a pro contract, which I wouldn't have been because I was too young to get a pro contract, they pay a fee of compensation, what they feel is justifiable you know, for his potential. Okay. Um, and at that time, two million pounds was a, a record fee for a schoolboy. Um, compensation or fee, I think it was probably um, not County's biggest fee at the time. Um, how, how did it make you feel? I mean, were you, you know, were you kind of king dingling of the playground, you know, cocky? Um, which, <laughs> I kind of didn't have time. I was shot straight down to London. Um, when they agreed a fee, I the, uh, the next day I had a knock on the door. Um, we're going to we're going to London uh, straight down the M1 to, to speak with Arsenal. But my last year of school, I wasn't in school anyway. I was training with Notts County. They kind of saw my talent and thought, he's not going to be a scientist uh, or, or mathematician. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's kind of waited at school. Let's give him a year experience working because you couldn't just leave school. So they said a year experience to cover themselves and work with Notts County. I was just in the in the, the youth team. And were your parents uh, supportive of your of your talent and your potential future career? Um, I think my, my, my father was, I think he always, he was always, um, he knew my talent and he was always pushing for football. But that's when he was around. He wasn't always present in my life because um, of his nature of his, is is what, what he's got himself into, you know, where it was from. It was a lot of drugs, a lot of crime, very tough estate where I, where I was brought up. So, you know, he did his best what he could and supportive him and, and when he um, could. So I think, you know, I, I owe half it to him, but the other half, I think it was just down to my dedication and determination to be a professional footballer. I mean, how much did you get dragged into um, the naughty stuff that went on in, in that hard life? Well, most of my friends was was involved in all of that. And, you know, especially the older lot. And, you know, I always wondered why I was never a part of it more. Because there was times when they would go on their misdemeanors and send me away. Say, right, you, no, you're not coming. And I'd be like, well, I'll, I'll be friends. But they said, no, you're not coming. You cannot come to this. We, you're, not, you're not being around us right now. Let's come in, come and check us or come in, see us tomorrow or something. But I didn't know until, you know, my adult life that my father spoke to the to, to, to the gang members, should we call them, or crew, and said, listen, if, if you're ever going on to do what you're doing, just make sure Jermaine's not involved. And, and they respected that. Because I feel my dad was 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 one of their elders as well, so they kind of kept me at arm's length when they was going and doing whatever they're doing. So when you went to go live away from home and you know do the YTS and stuff, I mean, did, did you did you miss that life? I mean, was it because I guess you know for kids who have grew up in that world, it's you know it's glamorous, it's it's um, something to I guess it's another sense of community in its own way and stuff, isn't it? I mean, did did, did you did you miss that? Or were you... Yeah, hundred percent. Like you said, it's it's a community. You don't people look in and go, oh my god, that's dangerous just place uh, but when you're in it and they're your people you feel safe but like I said it's a community you know no one's going to bother you and you know you can walk streets and be and be safe and safe as houses and know that a lot of people have got your back um, because of who your father is and where you're from and the crew and the gang and yeah you miss that 
And it's like starting a new life in London with not knowing anyone, not having any friends there, not having that structure that I had back in Nottingham. It, it, it was difficult. So I used to go home every weekend to see the to see my friends and, and everyone. And on the Sunday when I had to, had to go back, yeah, I kind of kind of missed it. And it was nice to see my friends as well because they was proud of what I achieved and got out of, you know, the area and the, the, the crime that all the, all the rest was still stuck in. Was there ever a point, I mean, maybe it comes later, but was there ever a point when they, I was going to say not proud, but let's say when it went from being proud to being like, ah, you know, you, you, you owe us, you know, you, you, you've made good, we're still in the, we're still in the shit, you know, we, we, we need, we need a bit of that cash. No, no, they've, it's, they've never really ever, ever been like that. Um, yeah, I had to distance myself to a certain degree because of the more you the public eye, the more they want to scrutinize you in any way, shape or form. So if, if I'm hanging around a lot of times with, you know, people who are in and out of prison or whatnot, or have got a terrible background, then they, the press would love to jump on that and, and spread that all over the, the press and, and, and whatnot and bring you down when you were at your highest point. So I had to be careful at times, but at the same time, I did re regret that as well because I think they felt to a point that I was kind of abandoning them and or moving on and not knowing where I came from and what they've protected and, and how they've protected me growing up, which I understand. And I, and I do regret is that you should never forget where you came from. And, you know, if, if, if you ever go back and people want to write about it, let them be, it doesn't mean that you're taking that path. It's just that they're your friends. So let's, let's talk about that, uh, you know, being 15 years old, getting, getting signed for Arsenal. I mean, you know, when, when did you first meet uh, Arsene Wenger? It was a couple of weeks after I signed. Um, oh, you'd not, you'd not met him or talked about it pre-signing? No, no, no. It was, it was literally, like I said, I was, I was in the digs in Nottingham. It's funny enough because, you know, I only live 15 minutes away from the training ground in Notts County but they wanted to take me out of where I was from and put me in digs. You had people in there who lived like an hour in Sheffield and Manchester, but I live 15 minutes away, but I was living in digs. Just to keep you away from Just that to life. keep me away from that life and make sure that they kept an eye on me as well. So I was living in digs and I got literally just no understanding, no aware of anything. I just got a knock at the door. It was a open the door. It was my dad and an agent, not even my agent at the time, a different one. And it was like, come on, son, we're, we're going to London. We're going to speak to Arsenal. And at that time, I was like, oh, oh, okay. You know, if my father said so, then I'm going to listen to him because he knows what's best. And then we literally just shot down, shot down to London. I met with um, Liam Brady, who was the head of youth recruitment and development at the time. And we spoke to him and kind of the deals was getting finalised you know, behind whatever you know, they was doing. And one of them took me to the uh, training facilities for the for the youth team. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And just seeing the, some, some of the youngsters train. And then I said, right, well, you'll be back here in a couple of days. Go home and get your stuff ready and get ready to start next week. And how does it work? Um, how long's the contract you signed for with them? Well, it would have been, I signed when I was like 15, so 16th birthday, I think I'd put pen to paper. And then a three year contract it was, but when I turned 17. So it would have been a YTS contract. Okay, so so, so they are they are guaranteed to have you for a time when, when, when you're, because you're not able to play in the professional bit at that time, are you? Yeah, no, well, you, you can, if you're on the YTS, you can, play professional you could go into the professional team oh you can you can yeah go but you team, can't right? sign a professional contract until you're 17 um okay so you could you could play the first team yeah but you but can't you not get paid you, yeah yeah okay. you'll be on your yts or your academy contract whatever that will be and then on your 17th birthday you then sign professional terms okay you then sign your first professional contract, and then so so you're 15. You've signed. You've they've paid the two million. You've signed your contract for a three year contract from being 17, 18. Yeah, United. yeah. yeah. Um, and did you know at the point of signing? I guess you must have known how much money they were going to pay you when you were 17. Yeah, but I was again. It was all kind of done over my head. I didn't really have a say. I didn't really know. But I I, not, I can remember roughly what the terms were. And how, how much were they paying? Um, you? Well, my, my 17th would have been like 5,000 a week. Right. Coming from where I come from was was unbelievable. <laughs> and then it, it only went up probably like 
bits and drabs. I can't remember the ins and outs, but it didn't go on like five hours and then eight or then ten. It kind of stayed the same. For, the, um, for those three years? Yeah. Um, but presumably you'd have been kicking well and really getting Yeah, and then get exactly then yeah. they would have, yeah, yeah. Um, that Well, that was the plan anyway. And um, yeah, so that's how I kind of really, it, it, it took off. And again, uh, when I was 15, 16, it was all kind of all done above and behind my back without me really knowing. It was just literally turn up, okay, sign, play. Did you feel any pressure? It's, it's weird because when you're that age, you don't really feel pressure. You feel more pressure as you get older. You just out there enjoying it. Yeah, that's when you enjoy football. At that age, you you enjoy it. You you look forward to games and you know, yeah, you want to win, but it's not as if you win, lose, draw. It's not as bad as when you start getting into the first team. That's when the pressure kicks in. And your first professional match you played when you were sixteen. But what was so? What was that? That wasn't like um, that wasn't a, like a first team proper match. That was a, a club match or something, was it? Yeah, no. My, my my first game that I played for would have been in the academy. But then when I made my actual first team, I came off the bench on my debut, and you know, it was in a cup game. Um, away at Middlesbrough I was 16 um, and then I had the record then Cesc went and broke it cheers um, <laughs> Cesc Fabregas but yeah that was was like okay at 16 it was more I'm only 16 so if I don't light up the world it's 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 fine I'm playing against grown men I'm playing against you know I think it was Ziegler the German international left back at the time and how, but how did you feel I guess you know sharing the pitch with these guys because I mean as a kid I mean you were probably still still a fan of these people yeah you know and, and they was still a schoolboy and they become your peers I mean and did they look at you like a peer or like a young lad that, to, to bring under the wing or an, yeah, an, an they, annoyance because you're there snapping at the feet no I think there was more like you know looking at oh a kid with a bright future and it's good for the team. It's it's, it's good for, for for Arsenal at the time, knowing that they're bringing some good youth products through. Uh, for me, it was yeah, it was a big moment. It was a really big moment, and obviously playing for Arsenal, um, I already made my debut when I was 15 at Notts County for their first team. So I had a little taste of it, and I knew what it's like first team football. But on a scale of Arsenal, was was a different kind of I would say nervousness. Um, but it, who I was playing with as well, it was it was a, a satisfaction of a great achievement. Of okay, this is this is what I've been dreaming of all my life, and now I'm on the pitch with, with Dennis Bergkamp, Ray Parler, Lee Dixon, David Seaman. This is where it all starts. And when you went to go and train with those guys, uh, did it did it make you uh, naturally up your game anyway? Because oh, you, had, you to. had so much to prove. You you had to because it, it was hard when you're training with those guys because they're all settled. They that's what they you know this is their first team. They they're used to it. They don't really need to make an impact because they're established. Um, but for me going in there, you know, I always had to give it a little bit more coming through the ranks and being so young. And, you know, when you've got players like Robert Perez in front of you or Lomberg on the left, Overmars, it was it was it was difficult. And you didn't want to put me personally, I didn't want to like mess up in training. I always wanted to make sure I did the did the right thing. And maybe sometimes I wasn't as expressive because I just wanted to just keep it simple. You know, rather than running at people, I go, well, where's Thierry? Let me just give it him. And I guess despite this very promising start with Arsenal, I mean, it, it never really kicked off properly for you then. And, uh, you know, you, over the next two or three years, you, you were loaned out to uh, to a couple of other clubs, you know, one, one of them being Le Leeds United. I mean, was that was that disappointing? It, yeah, it, it was disappointing that, you know, when you break in at 16, OK, you understand you're not going to then just be a first team regular. But then you go back to your training with your youth team players. And then it wasn't until I was about probably 20 maybe or 19 that I started training 20 when I started training with going in the first team dressing room so it was a long long wait and I started to get frustrated and then you get a taste for it and it's taken away then you go on loan you do well and then nothing really changes and then the big one was obviously going on loan I went went on loan twice to Watford but that was in the championship at the time but the big one was then going on loan to Leeds when I was 20 to 21. How long were you in Leeds for? I was a full season. Okay. Started into a full season. What year was that? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm from Leeds. Yeah, Leeds it was, life. it was, I think it was maybe 2002, okay. possibly. Is when um, we had Alan Smith and um, Viduka. Yep. The year we got relegated. 
Okay. So I think it might be two two. Not quite sure. We'll, we'll, we'll find that out. What, what, what was your um, what was your memories of Leeds as a, as a as amazing? A, where did you live? I live right in the city centre. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it was called the apartment block. Was it was oh, something at the keys? Oh, the keys where where, where Don Matteo lived. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I lived, lived in there next to what was Man Ray and Teatro. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I lived in there, the keys. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you used to wander to the Malmaison on a Saturday, <laughs> Saturday, Saturday night for a drink. That's exactly what I do. You had that just on the left. You had that Italian restaurant. BBs. BBs. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good work right there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was um, Leeds was probably one of up there with some of the, the, the best time and experience in, in playing because the city was amazing I had so much going for it and the team was young and they was like fun and wild all sorts of pranks going on and the, the, the fan base was unreal you know when you used to play Ellen Road and used to hear marching on together it, it was like a 12th man at times um, so yeah I've, I've really really enjoyed that time and I've always had a since then always had a soft spot for Leeds I mean, what would you put down your reasons for, for it not working out at Arsenal? Um, I probably, you know, because Ar- Arsenal's a, a strict kind of, you know, straightforward guy. And I, I would say maybe probably off the field antics, maybe sometimes my attitude wasn't wasn't the best. Did you feel then that you'd let Arsenal down seeing as though he, you know, I guess, you know, really put his head above the parapet with that signing? Um, I wouldn't say I felt like I let him down because there were there was times when frustration was started to creep in but I would never really have any verbal conversations of what's my progression what's his plans for me it was just you know kind of left to my own devices really and when I thought I was doing well for months and months and months you know you, I wouldn't get repaid or any, anything it would be in the reserve games and I wanted to, just wanted to play then and so frustration started keep going, creeping in on a Saturday, you're not in the squad. So then what do you do? You go out. If you're not playing, you're not, in, you're not in training Sunday. So then you would go out. And then it kind of got inside the wall. I'm not really wanted. So that them habits started creeping in of, well, if I'm not playing, what else am I going to do? I mean, what did you want Arsene to say to you? I, mean, I want to know just where, where I started within within his plans. Do I have a chance of getting in the first team? Do I need to work hard at this? Do I, what, what, what's, it, was what's just his... No, it wasn't that there was negative communication. There was just no communication. Yeah, you know, I think we had, a, we had a conversation where he said, you know, you're doing, it's been like, you're doing, you've been great for, for this past six months. Keep going. I thought, okay, that, that's that's nice. That's, all right, I'll, I'll keep going. But then nothing really materialised. You know, I made my debut, uh, my first professional debut for Arsenal, like when I was 20, 21. And I've been there since I was 15 or 16. So it was a long time to to not even start a game. And then you started a game, score, I scored a hat-trick on my debut. And then even that wasn't enough to get me more involved. And it just felt like another kick in the teeth. It was like, oh my, what, what have I got to do? How How is it possible that I, you know, score an hat-trick, most teams, if you go out, you start in the next game. Um, but I wasn't even involved in the the, the, the the cup final. The game I scored that trick, but there was a cup final the following week. wasn't involved. It just felt like I just I wasn't needed. Did you did you never try and start the conversation with him? No, because I, it was always like, hard to kind of felt to talk to Arsene. It was you know it was like a head head teacher at times. You know I don't, I don't want to knock on his door. And then, you know, tell me off. So um, I, I didn't. And that's kind of my, that's the way I am. I really don't like confrontation. Did you talk about it with the other players? Yeah, I speak with my agents, speak about other players, especially what, Ashton what Cole. They, what were the other players saying? He was just like, yeah, you just got to keep going. It's just just keep going. You know, you, you, you're so close. And I like, in my head, I was like, I've heard this for so much. It's just, it doesn't. And then in my head, I got, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what I do. And obviously, being diagnosed with, with ADHD when I was 30, I think, 30, you know, like last year, I was battling that all the way through my career as well, all the way from my childhood, all the way through my, or from my, 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 my adult life and not knowing. So when things weren't going well and that frustration started to kick, kick in, but the ADHD would take over and think, oh, just do this, just just take this risk, just do that. And then that's when these bad decisions start coming in and, and the mistakes off the pitch, which then probably also will go, yeah, this is, this is why, this is why. But... You know, it was just getting himself into a bad, 
bad circle. So talking about uh, bad decisions and uh, things not going well off pitch, you know, it's 2005, you're, you're on loan to Birmingham City. And I think things were going all right on pitch, I think, for yeah. you at, at the time. Uh, and then you got um, arrested for drunk, I think you were drunk driving. Drink driving, yeah. Drink driving, yeah. no license, no insurance. No, no, I had, that why I, I, I was fully... Oh yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, you yeah. I just, I just, just got caught drink driving. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no, you're right. Well, the, 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 sorry, 2005. I had a. No, it's crazy because I, it was a week left of my ban. Okay. Yeah, it was a week left of my ban, but I decided to get in a car and and, and drive after a night out. So I didn't. I've got home. So I've been out. Were you, were you, so presumably you'd driven to where you were going anyway when you were sober and then drove back drunk? No, so got a cab, gone out, night out with the boys. I've got home, you know, stopped off at McDonald's, ate, I felt great, got in a car afterwards, then drove. <clears throat> Obviously got stopped, <clears throat> sorry. Then, um, yeah, got a breath rise and I was over the limit and had a week left on my ban. But then that's many mistakes of the ADHD. I'm not saying you're not know, making excuses, but did you know? Did you know you were were you comfortably over the limit? I mean, you, you knew you shouldn't have been driving. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, I've been out all night. I know it's not going to be probably safe to drive until probably the morning over the limit. So, so you see those blue lights flashing behind you. What's going through your head? Oh, it's yeah. You fucked it now. Yeah, it's over. And then you just think, right? It's got to deal with the consequences now. And how how long did it take between? I mean, just, I guess just talk us through the process. But I guess you'll have been you'll have been arrested at the scene and take taken to a cell overnight, presumably. Yeah, so arrested at the scene, taken taken to a cell, booked me in, and they let me you know um, go in the morning. So then I obviously went home. It was straight away all over the press, and I just wanted to hide. Who did you, who did you ring first? Uh, my agent uh, rang my agent. You give you a bollock in. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said the club, I just had enough now. And then luckily that Birmingham came in and wanted to take me on loan. Wow, that was all pending my my driving and conviction because it was my second second one. How how long did it take from, from arrest to going to court? I think it was probably three months. Okay. So I think the court was in was in April. And I think that was in February. Oh, May, yeah, so it's May, I think. I can't, yeah, but about three months. It was from the from the from the incident to, to court. Um, so I signed for a season on loan at, at uh, Birmingham. They knew there was a court case pending, but no one knew what the outcome was going to be. It was not what everyone expected. I mean, you, you say no one knew what the outcome was going to be, but presumably a solicitor must have told you to brace yourself for the worst. He, he said, "Look, there's, yeah, there's always up." Up, you know, always that chance that yeah, they might send you a, a custodial sentence. But you know, he said there was a, a case before where the woman's doing exactly the same with two kids in the in the back, and she's got a um, community service and a, a suspended sentence for for however long. And I thought, okay, well, you know, there's there's hope. And you now that the my, my QC at the time strongly believe right, you're going to obviously get similar, maybe more. Spend a sentence, maybe more community service, maybe a, a bigger fine, and all, all this. So, yeah, let's just you know be positive and all the way through. He was very, very confident. It was my second. Okay, it was my second, second offence. And he said, "There's been people who do three, four, fives and not actually go down for for a drink driving charge." And do you think? Do you think you were specifically made an example of them? Yeah. Uh, when I spoke to QCM major after we said, because it was it was such a big case at the time, it was all over the all over the news, over the press, you know, it was all, it was televised. So he 100% made an example. And unfortunately I was the one that was making an example, making an example off. And you know, the, when that news came in, it was, it, it didn't even sink in. I, I didn't prepare, like I said, I, all of us was com confident and convinced that it wouldn't be, 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 be a custodial sentence so because of what, what your job is, it's, you know, it was going to ruin were you playing okay in the run up to that? Though? It's was playing you, amazing. Your head was good. Yeah, yeah. I was just literally focused on, on football. And again, because I was convinced that, you know, I'm not going to be sent. Yes, there's a, there's a chance because 
that's 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 the law but I was confident and everyone else around me was confident and I didn't think about it at all until literally the day before the the court hearing when I was you know with my with my girlfriend talking about it I thinking oh there's the chance and I was, I was I was shitting it and then yeah when that when that actually got there and he, he, the words came out of the judge's mouth for uh, three three months custodial sentence I was just in sh- I was numb and and I don't know much about it, so tell me if I'm wrong. But I think here in the UK, you, at that point, you go to jail there and then do you? There's no going home to. Wake oh up, no, 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 no! There was there was no going home. It's straight into. Because uh, in America they have like separate sentencing, yeah. another chance yeah. to. Right. No, they um once they set once it was sentenced, once the judge gave his his, his verdict, I got uh, escorted by the, the the staff, the security guards into the back of a van, and then straight to uh, A class, A category prison, which for a, for a f- offence like that, you usually go to a, a, a D category, which is like a, a, an open open prison. Doesn't everyone start at A anyway? Yeah, they start at A, and then you get shipped and moved on to whatever your offence is. You know, it's deemed in the category for it. And I mean, how how did you feel that first night in jail? How, how were people I was, treating I, you? Um, people fine. People didn't really bother me too much. Um, it was all in the press every every single day, and people were coming up, you know, asking, "Can I sign this?" And I was thinking, "This is a bizarre. I'm in prison here. What am I doing signing?" You know, um, but no one really bothered me. Um, I was going to say it, it was more. A, we want an autograph, not we're going to yeah, stab yeah. you in the yeah, shower yeah, unless you pay yeah. us ten grand. You know, it's it's. I did think that at first when I when I was going into prison, like, am I going to get targeted? You know, people going to make a try and make a name for themselves, get them in headlines or whatnot. But I didn't. Maybe because I was on the house wing. That's where everybody goes when they first come in to then get sent to their whatever their, their wings to to. You know, you got your murders and your them kind of crime, major crimes and certain wings and pedophilia in certain wings and, and terrorists in, you know, other different wings. But the house wing is where the most staff is because it's most intense because everyone's coming in and going, coming yeah. in and going. So it's kind of the most safest because, like I said, there's a lot of screws on there and the other wings are kind of, you know, left you undivided to a certain time. Did you share a cell with someone? No, no, no. They asked me when I first got there, saying, do you want to share or do you want to go on your own? And I, I had no idea. I mean, in my mind, I thought, I'm going to be absolutely bored out of my head. Yeah, let's share. I said, I'll share. And then the officer looked at me and went, no, no, no. And I was like, why? They goes, just go on your own. And I went, okay, then I'll go on my own. So I went on my own, um, which is probably the right and the correct decision at the time. So yeah, the first night was, it, it, I was just numb. I was just really like, it's, it didn't sink in. It, it really didn't sink in. And I was just there, just literally going through the motions. And then it was the couple of days later was like, wow, what have I just done? Where am I? How long was it from first going in till someone comes to visit you? Um, I think it was about a, a week. No phone calls? Or... I was like phone calls. Sure. Yeah, so I'd phone. My girlfriend, um, family, agent. I think you get like one, a, one a day or something. I get. Are you immediately fired at that point from work, or are you still collecting money? Um, I wasn't. I don't think I was paid. I wasn't paid, but at the time, it was crazy because just before I got pulled for the drink driver in Arsenal, was going to offer me a new contract, twenty grand a week. Days before uh, I, I got the the, the the pulled over, I wish my agent would have told me previously, and maybe I would have. <laughs> You know, done things a lot different, but how and at what point did uh, you speak to Wenger? Um, you know, either either from getting getting arrested or going to jail. I didn't have any oh, communication yeah. with with Wenger. I didn't have any communication with with Arsenal. He was just my agent and Arsenal. And obviously, <clears throat> I've already had my spell at Birmingham on loan, pending the decision of going into prison. And then while I was in prison, Steve Bruce and Birmingham wanted to sign me, even though I was in there for a month. Is that how long you, you did a month, did you? It was a three-month sentence, a month in there, and then the, um, the rest was on house arrest. And I know, obviously, I know you weren't in there that long, but I mean, during the time you were there, I mean, what, what about sport? You know, like, did you, did you do any gym? Did you play any football? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think 
the the club and the the um, correction facility said, look, can he can he train? Can he go to the gym on a daily basis? Where I think you're allowed gym twice a week or or maybe daily. I'm not, I can't remember, but I was getting gym morning and afternoon. And I think you choose one okay. if you're a normal. But I was getting it morning and evening and daily. And they did uh, a football game once. You know, I think once a week they have like a on a football pitch where the inmates <clears throat> play together. I guess you were picked first. I was picked first, and I was all, all, all nervous as well. Uh, yeah, because I've seen Me Machine with Vinnie Jones. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking someone's going to fly in with a suit, you know, in my back. So I was like, a bit nervous. I'm not going to lie, and, and and there was some wild challenges where I was hurdling like Colin Jackson at times. But but yeah, it was just nice to get out on the pitch. But did you um, did you make any relationships during that month? Uh, not really. You you probably because it was. I was only supposed to be there for a week and then get shipped off to a category D, which is an open prison. So, you, you know, you lock your indoors, it's 10 p.m. lights out, all this business. You have freedom of the place. But I had to stay in the category A where the worst of the worst people are. Did you know why? Um, I, I flipped out, I went mad because I thought this is how I'm getting punished on a punishment. Yep. And I asked the, the question to the, to the governor. He came and saw me. And says, look, we've got to keep you here. And I says, why is that? I'm not a risk. I'm not a, you, you know, who I am. And they said, because if you go to a category D, it's kind of open to the public to a certain degree. And there'll be a lot of press. And it's not fair on the other inmates. If you're walking along and someone's in the background and you're getting snapped by the press and there's all over the, all over the media. So for their safety or their privacy we've got to keep you keep you here and that was just devastation that that was devastated because i'm in this place where i'm you know kind of locked up 20 22 hours of the day and then after that they said we'll give you a job so i was mopping the always where basically you, you kind of out your cell most of the time you know doing work and folding clothes for new arrivals you know ch tracksuit and uh, like gray joggers and bedding you wrap them all up, put them in a... Like uh, the kit boy, the prison kit boy. The prison kit boy and mopping and then kind of moved on to the canteen, serving food. You get little little bonuses if you do that because you get extras and all this. So they kept me out doing jobs. And so I wasn't always bored. And then they had also pool and table tennis in the area where you'd come out and mix with, with other people. But you mix with other people not knowing who or what they are. They could be an absolute scum and a paedophilia and rapist and you're mingling and then they get shipped off a couple of days later, which, which, um, which I was, I was playing table tennis with this gentleman and he, he, he's gone after his, you know, once his time is up on the, on the house, house wing, he gets shipped off to where he's going. And I was going to the gym and we had to go, we had to wait until all these people finished. And I said to one of the one of the gents, I said, oh, why have we got to wait? What, what's that? Because I oh, know we're segregated from then because they're the, the pedophilias and the rapists. And then I saw the gentleman walk past who I was playing table tennis with. And I was like, wow. It's just, I was like, I can't believe I'm actually in this world. I can't believe I'm amongst all of this. And who? so you came out after a month. Who, uh, who came to meet you? Uh, my agent. Um, he came and picked me up and took me and to Birmingham. And when you came out, Birmingham wanted to buy you, didn't they, at that point? Yeah, I think Did they, you know about that while you were in jail or did that happen when you came out? I think I was aware of it. Um, Steve Bruce came to visit me as well. Um, so I was I was definitely aware of actions going on. And it was just all about to, for, for me to come out and, and agree terms. Um, so I didn't really know what was being negotiated. Once I was in there, it was when I got out that I just said, yeah, all right, cool. I was just happy that I got thrown another lifeline. And, and tell me, because like I, I mean, I am I'm not, a fo not a football guy. So, I, you know, I, I, um, I, guess I don't really know what ha happened around that time and, you know, what other players were. But, you know, in, in today's in today's world, it sounds a seriously brave, what's it brave? I mean, someone almost say stupid manoeuvre by, by Birmingham to put the, he put the head up and say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll buy Jermaine, we'll take him on. I mean, there must have been many, you know, not, you know, doing, um, doing your talent down, but I mean, there must have been plenty of other people who could have bought without having to take the rap of being the club that bought uh, a guy who's just got out of jail. Yeah, 
hundred percent. Couldn't agree more on that. But I think what helped my cause was how well I did on loan when I was there, how much I fitted in with the team and what asset I could have been on a longer contract, being there more permanent for Birmingham. And I, I guess how I applied myself when I was at Birmingham and how I got on with Steve Bruce. And I, I feel if it was a different manager, probably would have been a different outcome. But I think that Steve Bruce saw that he could manage me, that he could keep tabs on me and nurture me to the best of, of, of his abilities. Um, and again, another manager would have looked away and thought, that's too much hard work, that's too much of a risk, too much baggage. Um, so all those things that I've just mentioned, I think played a massive part into for, for Birmingham and Steve Bruce making the decision. And from coming out and going onto the pitch, how, how long did it take for it to die down? I mean, you know, when you were playing that first game, first game back, I mean, were you getting any shit from the fans? Oh, I was getting all sorts of stick because not only was I in prison, but I had a tag on as well. What I had to play with. Oh, you were playing with a tag? I had to play with an electro electronic tag. So, you know, it was a bit weird that, you know, the 30, 40,000 people know where I am. You're going to know where I am. Nowadays, you could have just called it a Fitbit. <laughs> yeah, you could have. <laughs> it was a very big, large Fitbit, though. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I played with my tag and then every, every week, you know, I'd, I'd get, you know, slated for it. And I think even years you know, when I was at Stoke, which was in 2013, I was still getting songs like, Pennant, and then it would be like, where's your tag on? Pennant, where's your tag? And I was like, Jesus Christ, guys, it's almost 10 years ago, leave it out. But yeah, I was st still, always, still, still getting those, those slanders. But did you, did you kind of tell yourself you've turned over a new leaf when you came, that, that, that was your, that, that was your second chance, your redemption, you weren't going to fuck around anymore, you were going to keep your head down, behave off pitch, on pitch, and do the best you could? That was my intention. That was what I was telling myself. But again, when you're battling with ADHD, all what you're telling yourself doesn't matter because with ADHD, you've, you, you're you prone to taking risks. You don't care about the consequences. You don't see, you know, the future. You want to take these risks. Yes, please, a bit water. And you just take, you, you make bad decisions. And not knowing why i was just thinking that oh, i'm just a nutcase so uh, but, but what what specifically were you doing you know what um, it was what it would be you know normal people would write i'm not going to go out tonight because i've got a big meeting tomorrow or i've got work at this set time i've got to do so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna keep it easy i'm gonna do what's right most, most professionals would but mine would my, my mind how it worked would i'll be all right you're not gonna drink that many you'll get enough hours sleep you justify, try and justify, you know, missing out on something. I don't worry. I, I know it's not ideal, but you'll be fine. You'll have a nice sleep. You drink loads of water. You'll be, you won't know the difference. All right, I'll go and do it. The dolphins of getting that, taking that risk, what, you, what, what an eight-day person needs, let's go and do it. So how did your Birmingham time finish? Because I think you went to uh, Liverpool after that, didn't you? Yeah, I had a great, a great, even though the team got relegated, I was, you know, probably one of the, the best players for the season. Oh, that's why you, le you left due to relegation? You, well, I, I got an, an offer came in from Liverpool, which was my Boyle, Boyle team, uh, the team I support. And they put in a, they was obviously watching me throughout the season, which I was unaware of. They put in an offer, I think it was 7 million, Birmingham accepted. And I was like, Absolutely. Because that, I mean, that had always been a dream, had it, to, to go and play there? 100%. It was, even when I signed for Arsenal, um, a, a paper got in, you know, contacted my parents and said, oh, Jermaine, they want to speak to you. You know, I was 15. I didn't know about press media training. And I've literally like a week just signed for Arsenal. And so we came home and they goes, oh, so what do you feel about Santa? I said, yeah, I know what I mean. What would it be a dream move? I goes, oh yeah, I'd love to play alongside Michael Owen and Liverpool. And then it came out in the press saying, Pennant wants to play for Liverpool, even though he just signed for Arsenal. I was like, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. So um, yeah, when um, I knew they was coming in, it was it, it was literally a, a dream come true because um, that's all I used to watch the Liverpool videos, you know, John Barnes, then you know, then then Robbie Fowler, then Michael Owen. It was yeah. And what did it feel like to play play next to them? I mean, was it was that pressure for you, or were you already happy because you knew you? Were... Oh, but it was always pressure playing for a team like Liverpool because what it. What they expect, how big the club they are, wanting to win trophies, that's always pressure. But when I first joined and was training alongside like Fowler and Stevie Gerrard and, you know, on the nights of Anfield, you touch the, the Anfield logo as you walk out of the tunnel. As all the famous players done, it just felt like, yes, I'm a part of history. And 
seeing all those all these players um Dal Gleesh, you know Ian Rosh do it in those videos that I used to watch and dream about I'm actually doing it right now and it was just that was amazing um, and people people say that it's um you know it's more than just a club Liverpool you know um I mean is, is that how is that how you felt yeah it's it's more more than a club it's it's so much history to it and behind it and the fan base is, is absolutely huge. I've never seen anything like it. Doesn't matter what per, part of the world you're in. It's, you know, the Liverpool, the Liverpool have got a massive fan base. And, you know, walking out in Anfield and when they used to sing, you know, you never walk alone. It doesn't matter how many times I heard it. You know, my ears on the back of my neck stand up. It doesn't matter how many times. Um, every single week I go out, that song came up, hair stood up. And you used to just watch and look at the cop when I was playing at times, you know, the ball would be out and I'd have a look over at the cup and just just, just see the banners and just see how they, the history behind that. It was just like, wow. And then right back into the game. I mean, what do you think it is that makes the fans so unique? It's their, 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 their passion for it. It's their, their, their passion and the way when they get behind that team, you feel it. You know, all, every team's got got a, a, a great a great base, but, you know, you, you hear a lot of managers, a lot of people saying that, the hardest place to go is probably Anfield because once, especially on the Champions League night, once that the 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 the, the cock gets up, once that starts ringing out, it's just second to none. What were your memories of that Championship League, Champions League? I've got loads of memories. Um, I think my debut, my, my first um, first game against Mahakabi Haifa, I think it's called Israeli team. Um, it was in the playoffs to qualify for the. Champions League and we won 2 1. I got man of the match. So it's funny. So the start of the Champions League, I got man of the match. And at the end of the Champions League final, I get man of the match. So the start and the end, I both got man of the match. So to, to kick off your career with a man of the match at Anfield was was amazing. It was like, ah, oh, this is this is what I've dreamed of doing, playing Champions League football, playing for Liverpool. And obviously other than man of the match, what's your what's your memories of the final? Oh, amazing. I think we I would say amazing, but bittersweet. We um, it was the better team. It was a great game. They had a strong team out playing against Kaka, Seedorf, Maldini, you know, Inzaghi, Pirlo. You know, being amongst them and playing against some absolute legends of the game, it, it, it was great. And the lead up to Champions League final was, you know, I'll always, always, always remember it. The the butterflies and the nervous that each day goes past, the worse it gets. Um, I remember having a brand new pair of football boots from Nike with my name in the. The, the game initiated on it, an initial Champions League final. And I wanted them to be as comfortable as possible. So I was in the bath, obviously, but naked, but with my football boots on. <laughs> <laughs> trying to yeah, break them in. So I'm, I'm trying to get any edge possible to the to the game on, on the on the Saturday. And I can't remember walking around my room, dripping wet with football boots on. <laughs> I was thinking, if anyone can see me right now, it looks absolutely That's a, that's weird. a football calendar picture <laughs> in the making. <laughs> it literally is. With Nike Mercurius on, naked in the buff, just trying to, you know, move my toes. Up and down. It was, yeah. Um, but the actual game itself, yeah, we were, we played, we played well. We were the better team. But unfortunately, we was on the losing end this time, 2-1. Um, um, but again, I got man of the match in that. So for me, <clears throat> from where I came from, the journey that I took, prison, to thinking that my career's over for then a year later playing the Champions League final getting a man of the match I know we didn't win it but that for me was was a great achievement bittersweet moment and I guess despite the fact that you were prepared to wear Liverpool's boots in the bath uh, once the uh, once once your contract was over uh, they uh, they didn't want to renew I mean how, how did that make you feel? Uh, yeah it was, it was sad but your love for the team is always going to be there but then you have to also think about your career you have to think about something that you've done your whole life and that you want to do so when you don't see eye to eye with a manager there's no point staying there and trying to battle away you might as well just go on to a new chapter and try and reinvent your career because you know you've got the talent and and you know work you might you know trade your magic magic somewhere else um, and, and that's what happened and you went to Real Zaragoza yeah from from Liverpool it was a free contract went to to Spain for a year so just talk me through the economics of a free contract uh, because so Liverpool don't need to get paid any money no so so you're you're doing your deal direct with Real yeah and does that mean you get more of a wage? Well, you would get more of a wage, yeah, because there's there's no fee that that club has to pay that club. All it is down to 
it's personal terms. So rather than that club having to give this, you know, club A giving club B two, fa- two million pounds plus your wages over a three year contract, you know, they're saving a lot of money so they can go, All right, well, we can afford to boost your wages up and in turn, you get a, a better salary. Hence why a lot of players, you know, if their contract's running out, won't renew if they want to go on to another, another career path, another chapter. Uh, but it didn't work out there. No. What, what went wrong? I, well, I struggled, I think, mentally a little bit. I didn't know. I learned Spanish on the go when I was there. So I got by, but it was difficult. I was I was on my own. Didn't have no friends out there. There was mm. one, one English player, well, not English player, but English speaking player. I kind of hung out with him a lot. But apart from that. Did you have a missus or anything that you went with? Not there, but I kind of got one and shipped her out. I was going to say flew a few in. Yeah, <laughs> I sh- shipped her out. and But again, I was in Zaragoza, which is very, very traditional Spanish old town. It's not like you're Madrid or your Barcelona, where it's multi multicultural. It's just literally old Spanish cafes and restaurants and not really... A, a nightlife or anything to really, you know, sometimes relax and let your ear down. Um, it, it, it was difficult. And with a few injuries as well, when I was sustained out there, new manager coming in who got me, who wanted me, new manager came in. He, you know, changed things a lot. And I wasn't playing. And then once I don't play, that's when my head just, just rolls off. And if I'm not playing, I, I find it hard to stay back then not knowing why to stay on the straight and narrow why did you take the contract in the first place I mean, because I thought La Liga playing in Spain playing against Barcelona playing against Madrid it's it's appealing and the style of football I enjoyed the style of football it was a lot less easier than getting lifted up in the air you know by these big burly centre-backs in the Premier League um, you know and, and playing against your Burnley's no disrespect um so it was more appealing and the style of football was a lot better. It was, you know, tiki taka. It was more technical rather than long balls, whatever. All this was, was was nice and I thought it would suit my style of gameplay, which it did. But manager got sacked and the new manager came in. He wanted to change things. I'm not his player, so he's got no obligation to really play me. He can do what he wants. And again, when you're away from your own comfort, when you don't know the language and then you're not playing, you get frustrated. And you 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 just you, your head drops, and then when your head drops, your your application, your professional kind of drops as well. And then he thinks that you're not interested, but you are. But you're just frustrated. So so how did you end up leaving to come back? Was the contract finished, or did you and get well, I had a two three year contract, three year contract, I think. And Stoke came in, wanting me on loan, and I think Zaragoza was was struggling a bit financially as well. So they thought if we can get me off the wage bill to Stoke, then that helps them. I'm not playing, so yeah. that helps them. So Stoke City and Zaragoza agreed where they would pay, you know, my wages or however part of my wages. And I was like, absolutely, get me back to England. This is why a lot of players don't, you know, travel abroad and play the trading abroad because it is a difficult once you've, you know, been in that bubble for the majority of your life than to go to a different country and not know the language. It's, it's it's difficult. And when you came back to the UK, there was a, there was a story about a forgotten house and a forgotten no, car. No, the car. The car. Um, well, it, well it's, it's partially true. Yeah, so I had literally on 31st of August to get the deal done before transfer deadline day of why the deal was off. At five o'clock, I was still in Spain. because Paperwork hasn't been sent. And I didn't get the old go-ahead to go and sign with Stoke and it finally came through and they said right you need to get to Manchester now before 11 p.m otherwise the deal was off so I rushed to the airport train station I had to go from Zaragoza to Madrid so I went to Zaragoza train station left my car train to Madrid from Madrid flight straight to Manchester got there in time signed the deal all cushy car was still at the train station I'm settling in Stoke you know, selling in a week, two weeks go by. I'm looking for apartments to rent and move into and good to be back, seeing friends and blah, blah, blah. Three weeks go past. All right, games are coming thick and fast, so I ain't got time to go back. A month goes past, my car's still there. All right, I'll go next week. It ended up basically being about six months and my car was still there. I, always, I, knew, it, I knew it was there, but I just didn't have time to go back and, and, and pick it up. And I thought, well, if I go back, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to have to put it in my garage. Then... Do I really want to fly to Spain to move a car to put in a garage? 
in your Spanish carriage. Yeah. You do, do I really want to, you know, it's just it's a bit of a hassle. Long way to go. It's not even like I'm going for a holiday. I'm going to move a car. So I remember leaving the key inside the glove box. Just I kind of envisioned this was going to happen just in case I don't have time. So I phoned up my, my translator at the time. I said, look, Fernando, can you get the car? So the car's still out, unlocked. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's unlocked. <laughs> It's unlocked. And then the translator finally moved the car. The, the, the parking bill was like 750 something euros. So he paid it, took the car, and then I sent in, sent in the money. And then throughout the year, I obviously applied my trade in UK. And then he would phone me and say, oh, what's going on with this car? And I was like, oh, I don't know. What car was it, by the way? It was a Porsche Cayenne, oh. a Porsche Cayenne GT. Over the years, I was like, well... I'm not going to ship it over. It's a left-hand drive. That's no good over here. And it's just number plates. It's just headache. So I just left it. I just left it over with the translator. No idea what he did with it. I don't know if it's got part. Oh, oh, oh you never found out? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> never, I never found out. What. I don't know if the wheels were off it. I don't know what. It's been stripped. <laughs> I have no idea. I think we tried to sell it in the initial period. But that was just a farce. And then I just, just left it. I just left it. Left so this part is true. Yeah. And now I know where you came here on the train today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Got no car because I've left it. <laughs> left them all. You've mentioned uh, ADHD a few times throughout, throughout this chat. Um, and you, you, you did you only get diagnosed last year? Is that what September. You said? Okay. Yeah. Um, so so since then, what have you done to uh, to manage it? Oh well, it, it's it's made a massive difference because now when I have these impulses, I understand it, and I go right, Jay, that's ADHD. Take a step back, think about it, think about the repercussions. You're just doing this on an impulse, and you're taking a risk. But but you, so you don't take any meds or anything. You just you just think through. You just now you know. I take, yeah, the only meds I take is, is it's called melatonin. Oh, to make you sleep is, better. Yeah, yeah. Because there'd be times where I go sleep and it doesn't matter what I've got the next day. If I'm even if I game of golf, I try and go sleep and I've played thirty six holes in my head before I even finally go to sleep. You know, I, all sorts. It's just hard to switch off. So I take that. Um, but actual, you know, meds. I'm not. I, I could have them if I want, but rather not but knowing that I've got ADHD and knowing that what it can do it, like I said impulse risk taking no care for consequence and now if I think of a if I, if I do go to do something I think whoa that's gonna put put you in danger like I, I crumble it was maybe like seven months ago to get in a car when I shouldn't have I went you know what don't do that you've got too much to lose where before I would have said fuck it oh it's all right you're only nipping around the corner no one would know you get back and then all oh, done you've got A to B but now I think about it it's even little things like computers I know now at a certain time I don't I'm not on a laptop otherwise if I get zoned in that's it I'll be on there till 4 or 5 in the morning like an absolute you know weirdo so um, there's, there's so many things now that I know and for my life it's it's, it's planned a lot better and look, I mean I know it's very easy to say oh if I knew this then that would have been different um, but I guess if you'd have known and understood HGAD, ADHD you know 20-25 years ago do you think your playing career would have been very different? 100% 100% because not only would I have known and now would have been diagnosed I could have told my coaching staff my managers that I have, you know, this, 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 I say illness, but, you know, being diagnosed with ADHD. So then they can understand as well my reactions and how my body is. And that if I look like I'm down or I'm not giving a shit, I do. That's just ADHD. That's, you know, we, we, when things ain't going up well, sometimes we, we switch off. Or if we don't, too much information, we, our mind goes somewhere else, elsewhere. Where a coach of staff will think this kid's done because this shit, he's not interested. Where if they knew, they would go, oh, right, he's, he's not being unprofessional. He's not being a, a, a bad lad. He's just, he's got ADHD. Yeah. And like I said, I would have t- a lot of different, I would have been aware of, it's not just my actions and me want to be a lunatic. I've actually got ADHD, which gives you these impulsive things. It gives you these, you know, decisions that, oh, it'll be all right, where you can take a step back and go, that's not normal. So, so yeah, a, a lot of decisions I think I would have made back then would have been totally different, for sure. And ADHD aside, um, I mean, h- how are the pressures on mental health in general in football, you know, p- play, playing at that top level? I mean, you, you, do you see it now you understand things better? Do you see a lot of people suffering? Is, yeah, is, you, is, well, is you do now because you, you're seeing a lot of players come out. A lot of people are saying, 
you know, about the mental health. You know, people think, how is that possible? You're getting paid X, Y, Z a, a week, blah, blah, blah. But it's not as easy as that. Yeah, you're getting paid a lot of money, but then you also have a lifestyle as well to maintain with that money. You don't, you, then you've got the pressure of trying to perform at your highest ability. Then the pressure of trying to stay in the team. When you don't stay in the team, you get down. You don't know what's going on in that player's life, personal life, whether it's, you know, wife, girlfriend, family. There's so many factors that come into, like I said, we're, we're all human. Just because we get paid a lot doesn't mean that the troubles that the normal people have, we don't have. Just that we got a good income with it. So when I was playing, there was nothing about mental health. I've, if I have really, you know, was in dark places, I wouldn't go into my coaching staff or my manager and go, my, my head's not with it. I, I, you know, I'm struggling because I would think that my place would be at jeopardy. They, I would think that they would go, oh, he's, he's, yeah, yeah, his head's not with it. Let's, 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 let's not select him for this week. We want someone who's, who's in the right frame mm -hmm. of mind. So I never had anyone to speak to, even when I was in dark places. I would come in training with a massive smile on my face, jack the lad to cover what I was actually going through, the depression that I was seeing and feeling. Oh, hey boys, I've banter, trying and then go home and then you'd be just in a, in a sulky. What about uh, homophobia in football? I had uh, a rugby player on, on the podcast recently. We we're, we're, we're talking about, about it in rugby. I mean, you know, did, did you, I mean, again, it's spoken about more now, but I guess, you know, going back to your playing time, probably not so much. I mean, you know, did, did, did you see anything or, you know, what would it have been, you know, what do you think it would have been like for a, you know, a gay guy? in the changing rooms? Um, do you know what? Back then, I think it would have been banter. It would have been just, I, I don't think like players now or, you know, if, if he was my teammate and he was gay, I don't, wouldn't look at you any different way, shape or form. There'll be a little bit of jokes, a little bit of banter. You know, you'd walk past him in the shower holding your, holding your bits and, and your back door, you know. Like, but as a, as a joke, because changing rooms, they, you can't get rid of that. There'll be always them those stupid jokes, you know. Um, but, I don't think there'll be any different bond or anything like that. I think it's more to do with the fans. I think that's what would be hard to deal with because if a player came out of my team and said, look, lads in the changing room, I'm gay, we'll go, oh, do you know what? Massive res respect and that's it. Go on a day and, you know, we score, we hug, well, you know, I'll kiss him on the cheek like you do with the boys, slap him on the bum like you do. Nothing would, would, would change. But I think it's the outside. It's the fans how because they they're ruthless they're not like us boys it's the fans of the ruthless that will chant all sorts of slanders throughout the game when your family's in the stadium online the abuse you'll get online all that is what they're afraid of and it will be the same from then and now but you know i think it's more people are starting to come out a little bit more but i know for sure that there is still people in the game that are scared to come out because of the backlash you know there won't well, be any backlash. People, people that you actually know are gay. No, I don't know gay, but I, I the, you know, there's this rumour do uh, that, you know, there is people who probably, when they finish, may become out. But I'm not suggesting you be with them. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's still time. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> we can wrap up now. That's it. That's the. That's the only quote I need. <laughs> Jermaine uh, Bennett says, "There's still time <laughs> to, to come out the closet." <laughs> I'm working on the courage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Monopoly, bo Monop <laughs> Monopoly boyfriends. <laughs> uh, no, so, but uh, yeah, it, it is it is getting better, but there is still that, you know, backlash that they're, they're frightened of how the public are going to perceive them and what's going to come their way. Well, let's talk about money. Money, money, money. You can't talk about football uh, without, without talking about money. Obviously, they, they both go very much hand in hand. I mean, how financially motivated are you? Um, back then and now, obviously, you know, you want to be comfortable in, in life. So, yeah, I think everyone's financially motivated to a certain aspect. You know, everyone wants to be, I'm, I'm now, I just want to be comfortable, be able to live comfortably and enjoy, enjoy things. You say now you just want to be, do you, do you think your, your financial aspirations have changed over the years? Yeah, when you're getting paid that much money and having no support, no stability, not coming from money and you're having the wrong people surround you and you're left to your own devices, it's it's hard to manage that money. So talk to me a bit about, um, I guess, about some of the money you had, some of the spending you did, the investments you did. I mean, you know, did, did you, uh, I mean, were you 
spending everything you were earning or were you were you putting stuff away? Well, it was in properties. I didn't, again, I didn't have any, I was literally financial literacy. Didn't understand it. Didn't, you know, I didn't come from a background with money. I didn't, you know, my parents never had a mortgage. You know, I was living in a council house. I got brought up in a council house. My dad never taught me how to invest money. No one really told me how to invest or what I should and what I shouldn't. Um, and you're, but your agents don't, don't try and help? The club doesn't try and help? No, no. You did, you know, you, the club back then, I, was, I guess now it's probably a little bit different, but when I was playing, it would be, you know, maybe the PFA put in a pension, you know, this much amount. But again, you you just, me would go in and go, oh, I just didn't understand it. And yeah, my agent really didn't tell me to invest in anything, but I, I bought properties and I would want it to be the mortgage as cheap as possible. So I was paying interest only. And I was getting, you know, at the time, 20, 30 grand a week. And just spending the rest of it. And spending the rest of it. And But but no one, I I, I didn't know. I thought, oh, it's fine because in 10 years, I can sell this property, it'll, it'll earn more money. If you're only paying interest only, it's not going to go up a lot of money. It's not going to, you're not so... I was just wasting money. From all my career, just wasting money, wasting money. What what, were you, what do you waste on? Do you have a specific proclivity? Mean, you like clothes, cars. It would be just yeah. It would be just you know holidays, you know trips to Vegas. You know, bill was one bill was thirty something thousand. Rather than getting cars in the right way, I would buy them outright. Bought a Ferrari, then I trade that, give them the Ferrari, then pay hundred grand for an Aston Martin DBS. And I think about it, that's just, that's just stupid. Um, Did it never feel stupid to you at the time? No. Because you thought, what, what because you thought the money had never run out? Or? And when I thought, well, if I spend this and I'm short, so I will wait till next month because my wages come in next month. But yeah, but I guess. But did you never think that there will be a time when there is no next month? You know, well, like, well, when you're 20, 24, 25, 26, you're thinking, well, I'll come down next year. Yeah, well, not even that. You think, well, yeah, I'll get a move next year, or I'll get a new contract, or worst case scenario at the time, I'll go China. You know, because um, that's when. A lot of people was going trying to, I, I thought, I'm 27, I've still got another 10 years in this game. I'm still getting this kind of wage in 10 years time. But little do you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So when did you finish playing? I finished my, my major contracts and probably professional terms, not professional, but Premier League was 2013. So, so how, how was your kind of financial situation at that point? I mean, yeah, it was good, but the, I didn't have a club for about you know, six months and then you can see with your outgoings, which, you know, 15 grand a month, when you're not bringing anything in, it starts taking a hit with your lavish lifestyle as well. Because it's at that point, it's hard to just then stop that lifestyle. You still maintain it. Your savings and what you earned starts going away slowly. And then and you get a new contract at another team, but it's nowhere near, you know, Premier League wages. So, so when you when you finished, what did what did you think? Uh, what was your plan to commercialize yourself at that point? You know, what did, what was life going to look like? It was dark. It was like it's it's hard. Every every professional will tell you when they come to the end of that road. It's not like they've got qualifications where a builder will come to the end of that one job and think, right, I'm going to go into a get a job here. Or, or when you're a footballer, once you finish, that's it. If you're a tradesman, you've got tradesmen on your. You can do that for as long as you your body can. If you're an accountant, you can do that for as long as you, you know what I mean. But once you're a footballer, that's it. Certain stops, and I've got no qualifications to be anything else apart from a footballer. And you didn't want to look at management and coaching. Um, no, because I, I don't think management would have would have suited me. So then I got into thought, what 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 can I what am I good at? And it was I thought media might be a good good platform. I thought I'm okay in front of a TV. Some people you know go shy and. And people saying you've got a good personality, you've got, you know, you're very char charismatic, so that would be a good option. So I thought... You clearly couldn't be a chauffeur. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't do that. So I, I tried to, right, well, career, let's go media. But for, the, for, for a year or two, it was hard even getting gigs like that because of my reputation with the bad boy tag. Is it reliable and all this? So... It wasn't just as an easy decision as like, all right, finish football. No, let's be a meet, let's be a pundit, let's be radio, let's do this. You know, the, the the offers and the jobs was was far from few. It was it was it was very difficult. And tell me, you were you were made bankrupt, I believe, earlier this year. Last year. Last year. Um, I mean, how how did, how did that come about? That was due to the taxman. Um, he was saying I owed like a, a million or so on a deal on on deals that shouldn't really be taxed. It was a uh, my, my Spain deal, but. 
I was a Spain resident. So on that contract, they said I should have been paying English tax, but I wasn't a resident. And I, you know, yeah. I, I had my residency card for for a year. Um, so they tried to, you know, make me play, you know, half a million tax on that. And deals that my agent would do with Stoke on my contract, you know, he would get paid 300 grand or so from the deal. And then they said that I had to pay his tax, which, I, you know, he's working for the club. So I'm like, what? So that's another, you know, however much on that and other deals that I would get for all my all these deals you know from a certain period they were trying to claim me tax on that so there was like worked out to be you know like 1.2 million that I owed and it, and it, so it wasn't it wasn't I say it wasn't disputed and obviously you dispute whether or not it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's morally correct yeah. but but this is not disputed that this is the fact that you do owe it rightly or wrongly you did, you did owe well, it they, you? I, I disputed that it was you know that the amount we, we you know, got it down, but they're still disputing still a large, large amount, which um, we just couldn't find the documents, you know, because my agent didn't get paid for one of the loan fees that I went to Portsmouth because Portsmouth went into liquidation. They went, um, yep. yeah, they, they, so he didn't get that money. But on contract, it looks like he has. So there was billing, so the tax, I had to pay this. It was all, all the things that we couldn't really get the documentation, so we couldn't really prove. So I was like, this is just... Just, just, I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, can't pay this. Then we obviously went um decided to go bankrupt. And um, so, I mean, I guess to, to, to have got to that that situation, um, all, all of the earnings from your career, you'd, 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 you'd spent them at that point. Yeah. Um, obviously, a lot of it would have been put into houses, you know, my child's house, which was bought. So a lot of money was put into properties. But again, you know, when you're spending £300 cash just on interest on five properties or four properties, it's going to it's gonna end up, you know, down the line when you're not earning. It's going to bite you in the backside. And then when you're not earning, you know, the the, the premise, pre, premiership wages, but you've made all these investments on those wages, like I said, over uh, 10 years, it's going to start dwindling. So, I mean, I, uh, just a bit of background. I mean, I was made bankrupt back in 2008. Uh, I mean, I was 27 at the time then. Uh, and I mean, d different, different reasons for me, but I mean, I, I built a, I built a, a very uh, over leveraged leisure business back at the time. I had strip clubs, pubs, mm -hmm. clubs, restaurants, and uh, it was all built on, on debt that was ult ultimately unsustainable. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the, the credit crunch happened. You know, my, my lenders pulled the plug and, you know, I, I went from, you know, eight figure business owner to, to, um, to, to 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 bankrupt, you know, with no money coming in to to pay the mortgage and a, and a, and a one year old mm. baby o, o, overnight, and you know, so I I, I mean I talk quite a lot about bankruptcy. I mean. Uh, I mean, your situation sounds slightly different to what because normally I talk to people who are always very worried to go bankrupt. You know, it, it's got such bad stigma around it. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. you, you, you're basically told, you know, you'll you'll never work again. Or you know, your credibility is shot to shit. I, I mean, I always describe it as a, as um, my analogy is like a cancer patient, and I say that you know, the reality is if you you don't just go bankrupt tomorrow and everything was tickety boo yesterday. You know, I, I say look, it's like imagine you've got cancer you're on chemo your life's fucking horrible you know every every day you know you're getting worse you know you, you, you're suffering you're suffering you're suffering the point you die it's probably almost a blessing to you and you know with with, with bankruptcy you know, the reality is is people go oh, but if i go bankrupt my credit's gonna be fucked well your credit's fucked anyway because because you, you know you haven't got any money you've put mm -hmm. you know you, you you've got ccjs you've probably got no you've probably got no income your outgoings are certainly a bit big, bigger 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 than your income so you know i because i talk a lot about the fact that you know a people shouldn't worry about going down that route if that's the necessary route and that also life after bankruptcy <laughs> isn't really any different to what it was before and you know what once you can get it get away from the, the quick bit of stigma it, yeah totally. it, it, it's it's something worth considering rather rather than you know li living with stress and uh, and i guess not being able to move on with your life i mean i guess your situation sounds a bit different because uh, you know it's it's a bankruptcy due to a single lump amount of money that happened at a particular time it, it wasn't like you were under pressure under pressure in the, yeah, in, no, in the but weeks and months it, before but does that i mean does my story because it still affected you? my the properties still affected you know have you, have you lost have you literally lost everything or you been able to do do deals with yeah know, I've got, yeah yeah so but but there was properties that had to go you know some properties had to go so and people chasing you and like i said it, it's it's the stigma i was absolutely shitting it i was thinking oh my god i'm gonna go i'm gonna have to go bankrupt 
And I was like, this is embarrassing. What, you know, going from that footballer to professional footballer, that 15 worlds, you know, rack with... Well, I mean, it, it, for you, I guess, it almost feels like you've got you've gone full circle from think, a, a, a state, a state yeah, kid, you know, no money, literally, riding like, high and back to bankrupt. Absolutely. You know, I thought, you know, what are people going to think? Oh my God, it's going to be all over this um, press. I'm bankrupt. It's just like, it's just that thought was just horrible and and you know really the stigma around it was i was literally shit. i thought do it hopefully it does not come out and obviously I mean, there's no sure, way it's not coming yeah, out yeah short times out there. <laughs> but here you go that was the nhd it's all right it won't come out that was the hd going it's not going to come out just do it just do it i was like you know i was shitting it and it's probably one of the the, the best decisions i've made because not only was i not looking over my shoulder anymore stress of every day how am i going to find this amount how am i going to find that how am i going to pay for this it's a clean it's not ideal don't get me wrong but it's a clean slate it's a way to rebuild your life you go back up that gets dealt with everything get pushed up this is what i've got this is what i haven't got here you go and then you re rebuild your life and then no one can come for you and go right i want some of this i need that i want that that that's all all done and dusted they may not get what they want but they're getting something and then you'll begin to breathe again you can wake up thinking Oh, this no oh my god, this bill's not, you know, I'd have to pay this, I'd have to pay that. And then you rebuild, you get your work. And my life is a lot happier. I am a lot happier than when I was when I was going through the the, the process of, of being bankrupt. And just um just from a practical perspective, I mean just you know, just talk talk for people a little bit about, I guess, you know, day after bankruptcy, uh, because like you say, you know, you 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 give your assets in, you don't have access to your bank accounts, etc. I mean, have, have you got the the kind of newbies co op bank account, the vanquish <laughs> vanquish credit card with a two hundred and fifty pound well, <laughs> limit? Well the chart well, like you said, all, all you, you know, the the initial period, maybe the couple of weeks. Yeah, it's scary. It's nerve wracking. You're having meetings with 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 um, insolvency practi um, practitioner. You know, you're giving all these details. He's asking all this this information. And with ADHD, I was like, oh, I can't cope with this. I just wanted to just switch off. And I was I wasn't a person who managed my financial situation. I didn't have records. I didn't have information. You know, I couldn't even tell you my you know mortgage mortgage account numbers. I could, I couldn't. You know, all I could give you is my address and postcode. The rest I, I wouldn't know because I have no letters, no nothing. So when all this this information that they wanted was yeah for me it was difficult. Then the bank got in contact, say right, we have to close this account, and I had to apply for a new bank account, and I couldn't even use Apple Pay. I was like, what, what kind of card is this? Um, so I was like, absolutely not. So yeah, you have to go through all of that, and then you think to yourself, oh my god, how am I gonna how am I gonna get by? But you do, and it's not as bad as people you know may think or how how it sounds. Did um did did you ever have any problems with your insolvency practitioner thinking you're kind of taking the pitch? You're like, oh, this, this is multi-millionaire footballer. He's hiding assets. He's got a collection of watches yeah. at his mom's house. But, but um yeah, so they they kind of went through that. I had um they started asking me about crypto, um which I had a a crypto account, and I said, oh, I took screenshots of it. I said, look, nothing's in it because I don't, you know, I only had a little dabble just to see how it was. I didn't put loads in, and they wanted the login details. They didn't trust that, you know, what I was sending them was legit. So they wanted login details. You can't just send someone an email and password and try and get in crypto. You need like two authentication. You need yeah. a, you've got to, you know, so I had to try and time it when they wanted to go in to send them this three digit passcode. The right, do it now, boom, email, you know, and obviously they got in and they realized, all right, it's, it's legit on that. But I, I think they must have did thought, you know, the summit's not a miss because they're leading up to the, I got a, 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 an email previously saying that we may think of, Restricting your oh, um, be be length, lengthening the period of your bankruptcy. Yeah, because of the way you maybe you, you know what I mean. They yeah, may think you, yeah, you, you're supposed to be in it. Normally, you're in and out in twelve months. Yeah, so normally it's quicker like may. nine months. But they've got the ability to extend if if they think you've been misbehaving. Yeah, they yeah. Can, they can extend so it. I, you know, he, the, the, the um, practitioner sent me that email, and I was like, mate, trust me. I've given you everything that I possibly can, all the information, all the financials that are there. It's not a guarantee that they're going to do that, but they said that they're considering yeah. it. Um, but I was emailing them back, like, mate, I'm not lying. But yeah, they definitely thought that there was some hidden gem somewhere. Do you do you regret your previous spending and your and your yeah. decision not to take professional advice and get more financially literate? Yeah, I do. I do. Looking back, I regret it, but I've got to understand that I had no family support. I had no one around me advising me in you know what 
what's best. I'm no one helping me make these finance, financial decisions. I came from nothing. My family was poor. I was poor growing up. You know, I didn't know about investments. I didn't know about mortgages. I didn't know what happens. I didn't, you know, I was kind of blase to it, not knowing. I know people say, but yeah, but you're an adult. Well, they don't teach it in school. And then my parents certainly didn't teach it me. So I was unaware of the dark side of, of when you have a lot of money, you don't invest them. You know, you just get an investment only and, and, and whatnot. I just thought it was a great way of buying a mortgage because it's cheaper. And yeah, obviously the, the spending side of it, I won't say I, I regret it because I was earning enough to kind of spend certain things and buy th certain things. It was just, I, I would say, should have maybe saved more for a rainy day or just better in investment. Someone should have said, right, Jay, you're earning 80 grand a month. Get off your interest and just put an extra, you know, repayment, three grand a month, you know, over, you know, three years, it's almost hundred grand, um, but no. It's a funny one as well. I mean, because I, I, I always, you know, talk about, you know, not regretting anything I have done, only thing that, th things that haven't. And I know it's easy to say in many circumstances, but probably not money. But my, my theory always is because you know, a lot of people say to me, you know, I've had some pretty fucking wild spending days myself. Mm. And, you know, okay, look, you know, um, my position now is better than it was pre-bankruptcy. So uh, I guess I'm not I'm not complaining, but, you know, often people say to me, well, don't you, re you, know, you regret that, you know, when you've you bought 500 grand worth of art that went down to zero or you've gone on, you know, a 50 grand holiday when you could have gone on, gone on a 20 grand holiday. But, you know, I mean, I, I t very much take the view and I honestly don't do it to just to convince myself, but I take the view that, first of all, if I hadn't spent it on X, I would have spent it on Y. And while I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, well, you could have put a million quid aside by not spending a million quid, but then you'd have just had the million quid to pay the tax man. Yeah. <laughs> and you, so you know, either way, you know, it's going. And, and I'm just thinking, you know, unless you completely change yourself as a character, you know, if you don't spend it on girls, you're going to spend it on cars. If you don't spend it on cars, you're going to spend it on booze. You'll find a way to spend it. But I also then, you know, very much believe, and I, I'm, I'm not into a, you know, manifesting or reading the secret and all that crap, but, you know, I do very much believe that, you know, one thing leads to the next to the next and you know i look at you know, the money I've, i lost on art well okay i lost the money on art but you know but during that i've made a relationship with my art dealer he introduced me to a guy who ultimately became became a, became a business partner who i did you know shit loads of business with you know a guy that ultimately i fell out with absolutely horrifically and then you know to again people say well don't you regret meeting him i said well i can't regret meeting him because as much as i fucking despise him now back you know back then i, I, I can't change history and he was good to me at a time when nobody else was and, and, and i just think you know <laughs> yes we can we can look back and we can say oh i shouldn't have done this i should i shouldn't i shouldn't have done the other but ultimately you know all of those things have, have led to where we are today and if we dwell on it too if we dwell on it too much it's just it's just more more negative energy that's uh, you know that, that's going to prevent any kind of moving forward and yes that's not an excuse not to make adjustments for tomorrow you know you've you, you know you've got to learn from the mistakes that you you know you've made over over the years and hopefully you know your your spending and your investment strategy is going to be different for you for the next 5 10 20, 20 years but you know but to but to sit to sit there every day go oh, fucking hell you know if i'd have got that car back off fernando that would have that would have been 70 grand and if you know if if I hadn't bought that girl down the disco, a fucking bottle of champagne, that'd have been another two hundred quid. But you know, you just can't live your life like that. No, no, you you totally spot on. Like I said, <clears throat> but I didn't. Fernando, I'm gonna yeah. find Fernando after this, <laughs> isn't you? <laughs> Mate, you still got that Porsche, pal? <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah, five hundred quid. <laughs> no, but you, you you're right though. You, like I said, if you're not, if I didn't spend it in one way, then. I would have spent it when, you know, the time where I had two years out and no work coming in, you know, I'd have, I'd have spent it some way, shape yeah. or form then. The only way I would have been all right is if I'd have changed something, clicked in the mentality of the way, right, this investment, plan, plan like this. But again, I was, wasn't in that frame of mind. I didn't know. Now, after being banks, I, I, things are a lot different. I plan and I know and I watch how I spend and, and things and I don't need to be going here and there and doing this. You know, I live comfortably and, and, and that's, that's my goal. And like I said, if I did get a big, you know, a gig 500 or 100 grand there, it would be invested in the right and correct way. You said, you mentioned earlier you got a child. Yeah. Uh, tw 12 years old? 12, yeah. Boy, girl? Boy. I mean, I mean, did you talk to him about money? Um, well, he's from, you know, his, his, his mum um, and parent family are, are very wealthy. But but yeah, they've they've got the the houses outright. There's, there's, I said, there is a lot of money, money there for them and him. 
So he's, he's, he's sound. Uh, Would he play football? Does he play football? <coughs> well, he sports Arsenal. Um, don't know why when I sport Liverpool. But, <laughs> you know, he didn't follow me like I follow my father. Cheers. He, he likes football, but like I said he's, he's, he's a smart boy and I just want him to just enjoy it at the moment. Um, but if he wants to continue to go down the football avenue, I'm sure he will. So talking about uh, big money, uh, very, very big money in football, uh, obviously yeah, we can't we can't have a, a money football conversation without talking about Saudi and all the uh, you know insane amounts of money that are get, getting getting thrown around out there. I mean, you mentioned China earlier that uh, that, that that it was you know China during your day. Mm. If you had your day again, uh, I mean, I guess two questions. One, would you like to have finished your career off in somewhere like a, a you know a Saudi or like like a China? Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, would you have maybe gone there in your heyday or would you have been happy to give up give up uh, trophies and glory and top flight football in return for mega bucks in Saudi instead it's a tough one because I can remember when I was playing I would say to, and about when the China was was rife I was like I wouldn't want to go there now when I was at Liverpool I would rather when I'm towards the end like 30s 31 because I think I'd still be good enough to play and the money was big then but the money that they're offering now I think it's going to sway anyone Unfortunately, I think it's, it doesn't matter how young you are, how talented you are. I think it would it would sway you into into going there because then you're thinking, even if I'd done two years, I could still come back to the Premier League at a top club. Are they going to want to take you though? Because you're not being in a really competitive well, league. I, I was going to say, I mean, do, do, you th- do you think the fact that, s- that some of these younger guys may go there and and you know have a year or two out playing at not such a high level, do you think that's going to hamper the chances to play for the country? Yeah. I think if, if you're young and you're uh, an international player, I think playing in the Saudi league, I think the manager will look beyond that because it's the same reason why you don't really see players in the championship playing for England. It's because it's at a lower, lower standard. Saudi Arabia, for me, is not on the same level as a championship. So if players are not getting picked in the championship, they're not going to get picked playing in the Saudi Arabia league. So I think if you go in there, ultimately, you've, it's, it's writing off your international career and looking after your generation, your kids' generation t- to come. Let's just um, talk a little bit about uh, Mason Greenwood. I mean, you know, to put, put some con- context to this you know, for, for people watching or listening, we're, we're recording in, mm. are we in August, August 2023. Uh, so, um, I mean, there's an announcement out over the last couple of days that Man- Manchester United are talking about taking Mason back on. I mean, what, you know, as someone who yourself has been embroiled in, obviously, nothing like his, but, you know, high profile, uh, negative press, you know, c- c- criminal issues, etc. I mean, what's your view as to whether or not, you know, Man U will take him back on and, in, and integrate him and uh, and where do you kind of sit on on pitch off pitch behaviour now you're an older sensible sensible guy I think it all depends on what the individual's done if it was someone who's you know been caught out drinking blah blah doing stupid stuff then you know the club uh, you never right to deem whatever punishment they see fit and that's you know, it's up to the club, it's up to thingy. And then there's no qualms of me and the player. But again, it depends on what you do. If you do something off the pitch that me personally would deem unacceptable or, I, I, you know, that's a no-go and the club want you back, then that's the club's objective. I wouldn't say to the club, I wouldn't kick off. What I would do personally, I would be a teammate and that's it. You wouldn't be getting any, you know, any, any conversations. I wouldn't be sitting next to you at dinner it would be arm's length it would just we literally we're going to training pitch we play together that's it you know if you're five fault you did something that no i can't i can't you know work around i'll be around that i mean even if even if they were a good player i mean you 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 wouldn't want them on the team because because you think i mean yes you'll keep your mouth shut and they'll be a teammate but you'd rather someone who'd done something didn't come back to play because it it offends your your personal beliefs and 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 it's it's going to bring unnecessary negative pressure on the rest of the team when you've got enough pressures as it is. Yeah, if I, I'd rather, in, you know, like I said this is my personal view. If, it, if someone does something that I was not to my beliefs and I, I I didn't really didn't like, I'd rather them not be there. But then that's not my call. It will be the club's call. And if he was and he was a great player, again, it will be just he's only there to do one thing on a Saturday. And after that, when that whistle blows, you know, we don't associate, we don't, you know, it's, yeah, I'll shout your name on the pitch to give me the ball. But again, if he scores, I would not be celebrating with him. So it's going to cause cohesion on the pitch. And, I, you know, so is that worth, you know, if there's three or four players with that view, mm-hmm. is that worth 
integrating that into a team. You know, Sky Sports, Monday night, Man United score, he scores a goal. There's four players celebrating with him and there's seven walking off. Turn the volume down. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not going to look good. Yeah. So would they want that? It's up to them, but again, the players will stick to their beliefs. I mean, we've we've spoken about um, how you've not uh, really had any financial help over the years. Uh, you know, financial advisors, mentors, etc. I mean, is there anyone that you would have considered a mentor throughout your career in in any, in any other aspects? Um, probably my agent. He was like my father figure. You know, there's only so much. Same one throughout your career. Yeah, yeah, Still yeah. Pals now. Still, yeah, like my manager now. You know, there's only so much he could have done. He tried his hardest. You know, to try and help out and keep me on the straight and narrow um he's been through it you know the th thick and thin prison out of prison you know trying to persuade teams to give me a chance um on and off the pitch stuff trying to keep it under wraps he's he's seen it and you know had it all and you know i've always he's confided with it. it's in my marriage divorce he's he's confided i've confided in him with it all my partners have always you know gone to me if they're moaning about me uh, which is a lot <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's had it you know from from both ways and yeah i think he's the, 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 the probably the closest person to my as a father figure and my father wasn't you know around has he given you any one single piece of advice that stands out as the best piece of advice he's ever, even, even if you ignored it i think the best advice he's given me is look just keep your nose clean for a few years just just you know because you you you, you might be good for six months a year and then you'll do something stupid that sets you back another five and you're moaning at me when you're not getting this gig or someone's looking past you it's just look just look at where your life's gone look at the future and just just stick to the you know on the straight and narrow and to be fair is, is 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 right you know for the past three years now you know i've just done my work and being sensible not being in the press which thank god because i hate the press they always murder me and like i said when you're not in that then no one can you know, make excuses no one can you know, look away and push you away and push you down like i've had throughout my career well look, i mean it's been it's been a hell of a career it's been a hell of a story uh and i guess you know, obviously from a from a financial perspective as we said you know you've kind of almost yeah. almost gone full circle but uh you know you've uh you've got years of experience and uh, i guess it's it's that, that that experience that's gonna gonna set the scene mm. for the next you know 20 plus years but i mean if you had to go back and talk to that you know 15 year old self who's just signed the you know the two million quid contract back in the day uh i mean how would you define success to yourself now success now is i would say being proud being proud of what what you want to do and people respecting you that would be a success now is being respected i think back in the past it was i wanted to be I, I was embarrassed of who i was and where i came from that i put on a facade you know a figure a uh, jack the lad a joker always pranking being valued on money having the wrong people around me thinking that oh because i've got money they like me girls they like me because i've got money rather than just being wants to be respected to be, be respected and once you i'm respected that's that's me being myself and being successful in my eyes. Cool. Well, listen, Jermaine. Like I say, it's been it's been a pleasure having you here, and I respect you for your honesty. It's been it's been good fun. It's yeah, been I've very enjoyed informative, it. and Cheers, I hope mate. we can do it again one day. Hundred percent.